That balloon of sound resonating invisibly through air and go on pressing my fingers deeper in to the neck as if I could find a shape inside its voice as I choke out its notes, its high-pitched scream, its pop. This next poem, um, the title is Transgender Teens on DC Street, August 12, 2002, and it's dedicated to Stephanie Thomas and Nakia Davis, and these were two um, trans um, girls um, who uh, were, were shot in and um, uh, I, I, I read about this, and, and I, I don't know what the statistics are now, but, um, but for a while, it seemed like at least one hate crime of this kind um, would happen um, a month. Um, and um, what can one say about this? Um, the thing that's sort of horrifying about um, consistent and horrifying about these crimes are that it seems like the people who commit them want to erase um, the very being of, of the person who they're, they're attacking. Um, and so often these crimes are um, extremely violent. Um, I mean, all murders are violent, but, but you know, there will be these things like repeated stabbing, or re getting repeatedly shot. Um, so, so poem takes that actual event as its occasion. Transgender teens killed on DC, transgender teens on DC Street, August 12, 2002, for Stephanie Thomas and Nakia Davis. That night they lay huddled as if in sleep inside a car, corner gas station, out for cigarettes. It looked as if their heart, singular, shared and too big for either chest burst. Blood at first sat in spots, buttons sewn across a blouse, sudden and undone. Each shot more than 10 times in the face. I believe the undiscovered assailant could not bear their bodies the way they must. All their life lived inside a ghetto, within a ghetto. If only I could be just a passerby on their street, glancing up at their brownstone porch, not down at their shared headstone, and listen to a scrap of laughter over traffic, heat, and what they might have been saying to each other above the everyday and through exhaled smoke. next poem is called Memorial, and it's, it's in several parts. One, at 16, driving a girl across the desert inside my father's 76 Chevy Monte Carlo, listening to the distortion of its radio, inhaling that heat thick with dust, I passed motels, Joshua and Yucca trees, cacti, all of my life unfolding before me. No mirage, and the lights of the city dried up behind us. Two, inside the dim kindergarten classroom, the old film projector rattled, flashed, rackety reel coiling, a voice repeating. I turned back to see its image in a boy's glasses. Our eyes met. We stared across that room. Who could cut this invisible thread? Someone turned on the light. Next day, his sisters walked across 10 blocks of rain to wake me from my sick sleep, brought me a rose he picked that morning. Taking the flower, I thought of him then, staring all day at school, at my empty desk, how that flower must have felt inside his hand. Three. Tonight, the moon is a tin bell, silence its tongue wrapped in gauze. It glitters dully, but only if I tilt my head just so. A few hours ago, I slept with someone. I can never know whether I was loved even a little, and even
even if I was, this sadness welling up in me won't stop. How can the night ever be brighter? Four. Somewhere, a young boy pushes blazing lanterns out over black water to remember his dead. He holds a small blue flame, carries it from candle wick to candle wick, then back to his lips, blows it out, watches a pale thread unravel, disappear. This next one is called, uh, two more. This next one is called Dear C. Um, for a good friend of mine in uh, California. Dear C, the side of your house puked open. Our friends rode up in small boats with lanterns and waited for you to open your curtains, red and flecked with gold. I thought of your tongue and your tooth your gift horse tattoo. Everyone expected you to sing karaoke, but you were blowing some old guy inside the dragon swing ride on the pier outside our favorite bar. The sound of its piano drifting out of the water must have made you want to die. When he left, he pressed the crumpled bill into your fist. You held it like a flower, then tossed it into the waves. I swam beneath you to catch it. That's when the curtain lifted, and your room was a sail filling with light. We could see your face there, a movie, crying, but no one could hear you. It started to rain. Everyone opened their umbrellas and watched until the wind carried you away. And the last poem I'll read is um, the last poem of the book. It's called Etymology. Strange that you've let me give birth to my own body, even though I know I've always been a boy, moving toward what? Manhood, a constant puberty. I could replace my menzies with a thick needle filled with your fluid, thrust every two weeks the rest of my life into my thigh, and I think of the six days of creation before God rested, because I too am tired, and because my voice would it suddenly be godlike to me, thundering, waking in a deep vibrato, as if from atop a mountain, maybe Olympus, maybe a lightning bolt shot sharp through my heart because I am startled, scared, delighted. You are the magnetic fields, Elvis and molasses. The first time I heard Nina Simone sing, unsure of her and my own sex at age 13. You are an 18-wheeler ripping through a hailstorm, the umpire breathing over the catcher's shoulder until the ball burns into the mid, and there is the deep growl ascending. Strike one, and I am struck hard by the beauty of you. I am, again, an eight-year-old boy, simply admiring a tree in the schoolyard, my only friend who lifts me, and lifts me so that I can pick its single spring